Welcome to Left Right Center, where we are covering Colorado politics, first on CBS News Colorado. I'm political specialist Sean Boyd. We continue our Denver mayoral candidate profiles this week with someone I know and many of you know for her work at the state legislature. Leslie Harrod is the first LGBTQ black woman elected to the General Assembly. She's been a state representative for six years, serving on the powerful Joint Budget Committee and helping pass several major pieces of legislation, including a sweeping police reform bill. Leslie is chair of the Caring for Denver Board, a mental health and substance abuse nonprofit, and she is a graduate of the University of Colorado and Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government program. Leslie, welcome. Thanks for having Ray me. Center. Let's start with an issue that really is front and center right now, school safety. In the past, you've said school resource officers lead to more kids being arrested, especially kids of color. Is it a mistake for TPS to bring them back? You know, I was actually just with uh, the chief of police today. We have been um, at numerous uh, events together as we uh, really think through um, and mourn the loss uh, of lives around East and so many of our young people in our city, in our state, and quite frankly, in our country. Um, I personally know that it's not, it's not my opinion. It's a fact that when we have police in schools, uh, low-income African-American and LGBTQ students and, and brown students are disproportionately impacted and put in the criminal justice system. I recently introduced a bill a few couple years back that said if we're going to have SROs in schools, they should be well-trained. They shouldn't be there on disciplinary action, which they are at times. Uh, and additionally, they can't ticket arrest for low-level offenses. Offenses that are in the disciplinary code should be handled by the school disciplinary code um, and with things like restorative justice practices. Uh, that's important. But in conversations with the chief, and I got to tell you, I'm um, proud to say that he's our chief today. He uh, is feeling what's happening in our city very personally, very deeply, and he wants to make sure that the response is fair. Um, he knows that bringing SROs back into East or into any of our high schools right now is a short-term solution that's begging for long-term real solutions. So some mayors oversee their school district. Should Denver's mayor? No, I don't think we're there. I don't think we're at a space where the mayor needs to step in and oversee the school district. What does need to happen is there needs to be a better relationship. We are working hand in hand, not only to ensure that our kids have the best quality education, but to understand that schools are a part of our society. Uh, great cities have great schools. Additionally, great schools are supported by their cities. Our schools need more resources. They need more support. They can't do this alone. And the mayor should be working hand in hand to ensure that we're giving the best quality education to our young people and that the adults that are supporting them are also supported. So I don't need to tell you, most criminal justice reform comes at the state level. Yeah. I want to ask you about a few bills that are making their way through the legislature this year. One yeah. would require kids 12 and under be referred to services instead of youth corrections for every crime but murder. The District Attorney's Council says over 10 years, 2,500 kids ages 10 to 12 were charged with violent crimes or sex crimes all but four of them were diverted to treatment instead of jail. The DA say what the bill does is it removes any incentive, any leverage that they have to get those kids to comply with treatment. Do you support the bill? I do support the bill. With this uh, 10 to 12 years old getting handcuffed and thrown into these systems that, quite frankly, weren't built for little kids, um, what this bill says is that instead of jail, there will be treatment. Uh, there will be community-based resources. We are spending too much money to incarcerate our young people every single day, not giving them a chance at really turning their lives around. What happened to a society and a community where we said, you did this wrong. Now, as a society, we're going to determine what to do moving forward, including your punishment, but also help you to retribution, right? Help you to understand where you made a mistake and how you can do better. Not just put you in a system that, quite frankly, might harden the criminal in you. Do you, you were involved in the fentanyl bill yeah. a few years back. Yes. Do you support raising the amount of fentanyl a person can possess before it becomes a felony? The way that I approach this is, and you know, my sister struggled with substance misuse um, all of her life and was in the system, in and out of the system for 30 years, low level offenses, all related to that substance misuse, which we then actually tra trace back to, to trauma, sexual trauma she experienced when she was younger. Um, I know and I believe that the punishment should fit the intent, right? So if someone is using for simple possession and they need help, we should get them help. 
if they're dealing, if there's other situations that are involved, that's a different story. And so for me, it doesn't matter how much you have on you. It's what is your intent with that and how can we help you or do we need to use an incarcerative approach? Uh, the weight limit, quite frankly, you know and I know, doesn't matter because fentanyl is such a deadly drug that if it's a, if it's a tiny bit in one pill, um, that weight could basically um, lead to multiple people's death, um, but other times it's a tiny amount and it won't, you know? And so that, that weight doesn't quite matter. It's the intent. Are you dealing? Are you using? Is it simple possession? Do you know you have it? Mm -hmm. uh, too often we heard of people overdosing on fentanyl who didn't know they had fentanyl in the first place. If they survive that, that uh, instance, I don't think that prison should be the outcome. You know, Denver is down 200 police officers. What would you do, if anything, to recruit more of them? Would yeah. you raise the pay, and if so, by what percentage? I would do similar to what we did at the state level when it comes to state state troopers and how we dealt with our budget um, at the state through the Joint Budget Committee, which was making sure that we reinvest in our officers, our training. Um, temporary uh, pay increases weren't really what got us there. It was making sure that they felt supported, um, ensuring that they can afford to live in the city. And so my affordable housing plan absolutely has opportunity for middle income folks to be able to live in the city. It's all about all of that together is what's going to increase our um, employment rate across across departments, but including in our police department. Well, good transition into our next topic, which is housing. You've talked about declaring a state of emergency yeah. to address homelessness in the city. What would that allow you to do as mayor? Yeah, I think that will allow us to focus our resources into getting people housed. Uh, we know that some of the alternative ideas like incarceration, quite frankly, don't work, but they're also very costly. So right now it costs between 200 and honestly $500 a day for someone who has mental health or any kind of physical ailment to be put into Denver jails. Why would we spend that money to incarcerate people when instead we can get them housing? So we have a housing plan. It includes social housing, low income income housing and middle income housing, where we're using Denver land uh, that we can build on to provide housing and support services for those who need it at the same site. These are the types of programs that we know work. We've seen them work across the country, and Denver needs to move forward in implementing them right here. And let me be honest with you, let me be very clear, these are solutions that don't take a lot of time to get moving. We can get actually shovels in ground and, and housing built within four to six months. We can get temporary housing built even quicker uh, with a partnership with the Village Collaborative. And so we have a lot of options on the table here in Denver. And quite frankly, it's a state of emergency because we should use them all. You know, you talk about those public-private partnerships, um, among other things, to increase affordable housing, but since enacting the inclusionary zoning policy, where new housing has to include a certain percentage of affordable units, permit applications for multifamily housing are actually down mm -hmm. in Denver. Yeah. So, how would you change that? They're down for many reasons. Uh, the number one reason I'm hearing from folks as to why they're not building in Denver, but they are building in places like Arapahoe County, Thornton, Jeffco, other places, is because our permitting process is unpredictable, it's too long, and they don't feel like uh, they have anyone they can talk to to move things through, um, through the system and through the process. That costs money, and they are building elsewhere. Um, we need to change our permitting process, bring down that time, and take accountability when Denver gets it wrong. Um, we also have to empower our employees to be able to make final decisions um, as to whether or not a permit can move forward quickly. Um, the times that we're waiting 18 months, uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's not feasible, but it also doesn't really address the problems we have in front of us. If we're not building new housing in Denver, we are behind, we are losing, and that's a huge problem that people are facing. I don't care if you're living on the streets of Denver right now, or if you're a young person looking for their first home, or if you're a teacher trying to stay in the city that you teach in and you love so much, we can't afford to live here and it's breaking us. The state is receiving $13.2 billion in yeah. clean energy investment, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act. How, how would you spend whatever share of that Denver gets? Well, we've got to expand um, the climate office. I think that's one really important. Additionally, you know, I think about my neighbor, Miss Collins. She's 80 some years old. I won't say her exact <laughs> age on TV, um, but she's living in an old brick home in Park Hill, probably over 100 years old home. Um, there's not been many improvements to her home and I got to tell you she is nervous about letting someone knock on her door and say we're gonna we're gonna um, fix your windows or bring in more energy efficient appliances 
but she needs them. Uh, and so when I think about what we can do when it comes to um, reaching out to folks in our residential properties that need to have those energy efficiency upgrades, we've got to have a team that's from the community that can actually uh, ensure that that happens and build trust within the community. That's where we'll start. But additionally, we've got to make sure that our, our buildings, our high rises, our commercial buildings also uh, are energy efficient. That's where we're seeing a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the, the misuse or waste or, or I guess missed opportunity right now as well. So we'll go ahead and expand that too. And then finally, I, I want to talk about something that I just uh, worked on in the community, which was really thinking about our composting and our trash program. Mm -hmm. I, for one, am against the increase in the trash collection fee. Um, it's breaking people who are already living uh, on the margins. But when it comes to the, the goals of it, which is to incentivize composting and recycling, I think those incentives need to stay. But Denver's not doing very very good at recycling or composting. We don't know how. And so I'd also support those um, organizations that are out there in communities helping people to understand how to compost, how to recycle, and ensure that Denver can lead the way on these issues. We have time for one last quick question here. Do you think Denver should continue to add bike lanes, uh, or would you eliminate any of them? Uh, yeah, no, Denver does need to expand our bike infrastructure. 100%, uh, uh, we have seen, unfortunately, uh, too many deaths, too many accidents, and too many near misses, if I'm being honest with you, um, around uh, our biking city, and there's many people in this city that want a bike. So I do think we need to expand our bike infrastructure. What I'm most concerned about are those um, blind intersections where, quite frankly, if you're a driver or a biker, you can't see what's coming around the corner. Um, I interact with them on a daily basis as I'm driving, and they're unsafe. And so we really have to make sure that if someone is biking in our city, and we should encourage that, um, that, that there's safe routes for people. And right now, we're, we're missing the ball. All right. We're out of time. It goes so quickly. It Thank does. you so much for coming on Left Right Center. Leslie is one of six mayoral candidates I've interviewed on Left Right Center. Due to the large pool of candidates, we are focusing our coverage on the top six fundraisers who you see on your screen. You can watch all of my candidate profiles now on CBSColorado.com. Up next, I'm joined by our analysts, Dick Wadhams and Mike Dino. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Left Right Center. Joining me, our analysts, Republican Dick Bottoms and Democrat Mike Dino. So you heard my interview with Leslie Harrod. Takeaways, Mike. Well, I think she has a lot of enthusiastic energy, and she's very confident in her answers. I mean, uh, you know, the bigger takeaway from the interview is, uh, as we see the election right upon us, uh, is, you know, she's got a good base. Uh, Northeast Denver, her district, uh, people who know her, and with the turnout where we think it's going to be so far, which is low, that's a big plus for her. Uh, I think on the policy issues, she's very solid. And as a legislator, you know, and, and a veteran legislator, legislator, uh, you know, that's a big plus. I think voters will be looking at, though, what's your, what's your executive experience? And uh, that's a harder one for her to answer. Okay. But uh, she certainly has uh, some really good community-based experiences that give her uh, a chance at the runoff. All these candidates are pretty practiced on their answers by now. They've probably done like yes. 40, 50 debates mm -hmm. and forums mm -hmm. by yeah. now. So, Dick, any surprises? Uh, well, no, she's got a big personality. And believe me, that helps in politics. But I also felt like she wasn't wanting to reveal how ideologically to the left she is. That I thought her answers were uh, kind of obfuscating where she really is on a couple of the issues. And um, I think that's a reflection that she knows that that um, uh, she's more liberal than the electorate, which is kind of uh, kind of an amazing yeah, <laughs> situation. I, I, and so. I'd always like to press these candidates, I will say, on, mm -hmm. but we have, what, 10 minutes to right. interview and we want to yeah. get at a lot of subjects. So um, I think depending on who makes the runoff, I'll definitely have follow-up questions yes. for yes. them. One of Herod's opponents, Lisa Calderon, has been endorsed by the main voices of the far left, including the Democratic Socialists of America, Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition, and the Working Families Party. At least one poll showed Calderon tied with some of the other front runners. Could the endorsements propel her to the runoff, Dick? Well, she did well four years ago, or relatively well, when she ran in, mm -hmm. uh, previously. I think it, she is a threat to, uh, to uh, Leslie Herod. I, I really do, because she's going to pull some of that left-wing support away away from her. Uh, if, if Leslie does not get into the runoff, I think she can look at Lisa Caldron and say, you're the reason why. 
Mike might disagree. I don't know. Well, I mean, certainly yeah. Leslie is positioning herself to the left of candidates like a Mike Johnson, sure. and a Chris yeah. Hansen, a Kelly Bruff. Well, I, I think, again, uh, the strength for Leslie, she has a constituency that's voted for her. I mean, Lisa doesn't. Uh, I, I, I think Dick's right. She'll probably pull some votes from, from Leslie. But, um, you know, what it really comes down to is uh, she has a constituency she can rely upon. She's been endorsed by Mayor Webb. And in a lot of ways, that's a much bigger endorsement. Uh, <laughs> uh, an endorsement from Mayor, uh, Mayor Webb and Mrs. Webb is, is a much bigger endorsement than from the Democratic Socialists. <laughs> and, and that's... You know that that's uh, going to mean a lot more to her uh, trying to get in the runoff than than any endorsements that Lisa Calderon's gotten. Yeah, I would agree with that. Well, far left leaders are also weighing in on Denver City Council races, where six candidates have been endorsed by the Democratic Socialists of America. One of them, Candy C. DeBaca, is an incumbent, so she's running unopposed. We've got five others um, to the far left that, if they win their races, we they hold a majority. Really, the far left yes. on council would hold mm. the majority. Do you think that's going to happen? No. Mike? No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I do think this councilwoman, C. DeBaca, has a very good chance of getting reelected. Um, <clears throat> I think the way the race is set up, uh, and it is a newer district, but she's a good campaigner. Uh, she, there are uh, the two other candidates are, are, are very capable people, but um, uh, incumbents are hard to beat. So I think things are probably in her favor, but elsewhere, no. Okay, let's just say what if, Dick, okay? What if? We'll play the It'll what be if Dick's game. ideal yeah. city if that happens. Will it? I don't know. Is that your slate? The, well, <laughs> I, gotta tell, I don't think it's any surprise. I think Denver is that close to being Portland or San Francisco in terms of losing control of, of crime and homelessness. And if, if, if that slate of far-left candidates takes the majority on the city council, if we elect a far-left mayor, or not we, I don't live in Denver, but if they elect a far-left mayor in Denver, I honestly fear for the future of Denver. I, I do. Because I don't think any of those candidates will do anything to rein in crime and homelessness. And that's what's killing Denver right now. Well, we don't have to worry about it, Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. No. There we go. <laughs> well, the mayor election is just a few days away, and turnout is less than 10% as of this taping. That's low even for Denver, where voters have a tendency to procrastinate. About half of the ballots in the 2022 midterm came in on election day or the day before. So, I don't know, are there too many choices? Do voters not like the choices, Dick? Are they well, apathetic? You know? Well, one thing's for sure, there's no dominant candidate. I mean, this was a cast of equals in many ways uh, to start with, and, no, and, and it's only slowly emerging who the front runners are. Um, you know, Mike and I were talking before we came in here, Sean, that maybe this April date was too early. Uh, to, to have the uh, maybe we needed another month for the public to really get into this campaign. I don't know. Maybe maybe we're wrong about that. But I, we were just talking about it. Yeah. So. Well, <laughs> traditional voters in Denver who voted in previous elections did are used to the May date. Uh, it was moved up a month. So they're confused and they think I don't think to turn I think this I think we've had a long winter I mean you know it's still snowing okay. and I think I think Denver voters are used to a, a, a spring election uh, hibernating you know still. but Dick's point of the number of candidates and what you've mentioned yeah I mean nobody's jumped out of the field you know the only front runners are those who raised money or have a lot of money behind them but that hasn't always mm -mm. Yeah. you know made it made the race so it's going to pick up well it, the people focus in the runoff i mean that's the bottom line i mean okay. we, 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 you know yeah oh yeah i mean i feel there'll be more people voting in the runoff we'll have a few other council seats that will not have been decided and so we'll have several runoff races, including the mayors, and and there will be more excitement with that. Do you think we're going to have results on election no. night? I mean, all these candidates, no. 16 candidates, no? You, you, you don't, don't think, think we'll have a, well, the results? I, th I, I, I think we'll have clock, results, I but I don't think it'll be definitive. It, I think really? it'll take till Thursday, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, it depends if we don't get very many more ballots come in. There's not many. Well, maybe they'll, they'll, right. they'll stay on top of it. But I think huh. I think there'll be a surge of ballots. But I mean, Probably. you know, when we've seen with the general elections for Denver sure. on particularly the ballot That's right. issues. That's right, Mike. Right. That's right. Some yeah. of them have turned around <laughs> That's over the course of like three or four days That's afterward. True. I know one yeah. thing. I think Mike's right. Whoever is ahead 
in the initial balloting, I wouldn't go to bed thinking I won. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Or if you're close yeah. to the yeah. runoff, you right. might be able to, you right. know, yeah. after another couple of days of counting, yeah. you, maybe you get there. Yeah, you're probably right. It's. Yeah. I think. I think it'll be close. And when you look at the at, at, at the people voting, uh, you know, almost 10 percent were Republicans. That was the largest yes. number. Yeah. So Andy Rajoy. I mean, hey, you well. know, it, it may turn out for him. You never know. You know, Sean, that's interesting. Mike said that because I've noticed in in email traffic and some communications I get, that this has kind of revived the Denver Republican Party, that they kind of ra started to rally around Andy Rougeau. Now, there's not enough Republicans to win. He's got to have more than that, but they are kind of rallying mm -hmm. around him, and, you know, he's going to get some votes. Yeah. He's getting excited. I know, I know. It could be a big night for him. Yeah. Oh. Andy Rougeau for mayor, and then the far left wing for the city council, oh, yeah. right? Wouldn't that be fun? Jeez. Well, we talked about the far left. Let's talk about the far right. A couple Couple recent polls hold some grim news for former President Donald Trump. According to a Republican polling firm, barely half of conservatives here have a favorable opinion of Trump, and more than half of likely voters cite Trump and election denial as reasons to vote against Republicans. A second poll by DU political science professor Seth Maskett found 73 percent of Republican county chairs in the country are considering supporting Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in 2024, and just 43 percent support Trump. Almost four in ten say they definitely do not want Trump as their nominee. You know, Dick, the new chair of Colorado's Republican Party, Dave Williams, doesn't believe that Trump is a drag no. on the party. You know, he says conservatives actually would have won in 2022 right. had they just supported Trump, right? But I think yeah. of Lauren Boebert's race, and that really yes. uh, flies in the face of this. Yeah, that district is very heavily Republican. She won by 546 votes. And there's no no more MAGA Trump person than Lauren Boebert. In fact, she flies off to Mar-a-Lago all the time and, and, and buddies up to him. Um, I think the, um, both of those polls were significant. Uh, unaffiliated voters clearly don't like Trump. That's why we cannot win a race in Colorado right now. Seth Maskett, that was a really interesting piece he did. And I think it shows the county chairs, they really are, they are the closest to the grassroots in their counties. Mm -hmm. I think they understand we only have a shot at winning, Republicans only have a shot at winning if we nominate somebody other than Trump in, in uh, 2024. Uh, that was a really great piece he did. You know, and as you've noted in a mm -hmm. column that you wrote, mm -hmm. the Republicans who lost the statewide races actually did better than That's Boebert right. in her own district. That's right. Right? That's right. Mike? Well, I, I think some of it's wishful thinking. I, I do think Republican chairs are like, we, we'd be better off if he wasn't around. But he's around. Uh, in fact, <laughs> yes, in fact, is. the indictment stuff has strengthened him. Yes. Uh, I, I saw some national polling that definitely showed him in, in a more favorable position vis-a-vis -vis DeSantis, and that's just with voters. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think Republican leadership, you know, is fatigued with the guy. But they're not the ones making the decision. It's yeah. the people that are going to vote in the primaries, and he's still in a, and he has the upper hand on that. And he's running a better campaign. Uh, there was a national article recently. He's much more organized. He's more strategic. He's looking at the you know the issues, and you know, and this guy got elected with a haphazard campaign in the first place. Uh, if he's organized, it could be he, a lot more dangerous. Did he like hire you? Right. I'm not just saying. <laughs> Mike he's Dino, organized. campaign manager. He's, yeah. he's the Democrats for campaign. Trump, right? Yeah, there you go. Make a lot off that. I will say this though: if you look at the early states, um, Iowa, New Hampshire they still have DeSantis in the lead. And frankly, those are the only states that really count. I mean, we get all Twitter-baited about national polling, mm. but when it really comes down to it, what happens in Iowa, North Carolina, or Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada, our four yeah. states, mm -hmm. that's, they're gonna determine the, nom the nomination. When you talk about Republicans being fatigued, not in Colorado, I mean, look their party chair. I know, right? you're right. Just ran that race. Yeah. Speaking of the party chair, <laughs> Four months before former Mesa County Clerk Tina Peters goes on trial for charges of tampering with election equipment, GOP Chair Dave Williams has offered her a job in the state party, heading up Republicans' election integrity efforts. See, I saved the best for last. There you go. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. You can't. No, that's a good story. <laughs> It's, it, you know, all I have is an image of, of the fox in the hen house, you know? 
<laughs> That's it. Uh, no comment? I, it's, it, I shouldn't be surprised uh, that, uh, that there's a wing of the party that absolutely thinks she did the right thing by tampering with the election equipment and violating federal and state law. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand it, but Dave Williams thinks she's great, so we'll see. And he's the party chair. He's, he's the party chair. He's in charge. Right. Yes. <laughs> And you're a rhino. I'm a rhino. <laughs> he's the, the fearmonger. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. On that, we're going to end. Thanks for watching Left Right Center. We'll see you next week.